everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us again. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to say thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask as always that you would open our hearts and minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. One of the great things about posting on YouTube <clears throat> is that you have the ability to go back and view any of the previous studies. And so in times past, uh, I've always kind of did a, 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 a mini review, uh, but I'm like, no more. So that said, if you missed any of it, you can always go back and review. Uh, but as for today, we're moving on. We are on Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15. The King James Version says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. So after Adam and Eve sinned, and before they got kicked out of the garden, God gave them, we said, hope. Hope to believe that one day their offspring uh, would be back in fellowship with God. And, and so hope that this broken fellowship with God would not be that way always. And so death, which wasn't there before, <clears throat> has entered the world through their disobedience. But even though death is there, life is still there. And so <clears throat> Adam named his wife Eve uh, because she was the mother of all living things. And when you think about that, that too is a glimmer of hope. And it's also a glimmer of faith because human existence, believing that human existence would still continue on because remember God told had told Adam that in the day he eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he would surely die <clears throat> that day death did occur but both physically and spiritually and so before they were driven out and shut out from returning God clothed them with a garment to cover their nakedness. God didn't just wave his hand or, or speak and clothes appeared. Remember, creation had come to an end. And so Genesis, remember Genesis, the second chapter, verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So when God made man and woman, there was no need for clothing. The, the need for clothing came after sin and, and because of sin. Sin is like a snowball at the top of a hill that starts out small and insignificant, but as it rolls downhill, it picks up speed. And, and, and that thing just grows bigger and bigger. And, and so in order for God to cover their nakedness, physical death had to occur. An animal had to be killed to hide uh, or cover over the effect of sin. Stop and think about that for a minute. The Holy Spirit gave me one of those wow moments in, in showing me this. 
Can you imagine the relationship Adam had with the animals? He had named them all. That's just so personal. Uh, anybody that, that, that has a dog or a cat or any kind of animal and they name it, that makes it personal, makes it part of you. Remember when God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. And he first made animals to be his helper. Genesis 2 and 19 says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. That's personal. Before the woman, there was just Adam and the animals, and he gave them all names, probably played with them, even treating them like family. Remember, fear was not a part of his life right then. Everything was in perfect harmony. Can you imagine how Adam felt when one of those animals had to be killed because of something he had done? Can you imagine how he felt wearing the skin of the animal? That garment becomes a constant reminder of sin and death. That's the thing about sin. Once it's put into motion, we can't control its effects. And everything becomes a moving target. We can't say, I want sin to just touch right here or right there. No, it, it, it becomes, a, everything becomes a moving target. Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong, but you expected a good result? And, and, and then after it was done, it didn't go like you expected. I would imagine that is how Adam and Eve are feeling right now. But there's no return to paradise. Unfortunately, we can't go back. Once a thing is done, we can't take it back. I, 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 I didn't mean to do it or oops, I'm sorry. All of that won't erase it. Once lost, innocent cannot be retained, recaptured. So Adam and Eve are in sin and now they're distant from God and they become the first parents to a race of children in the same rigid condition as themselves. God had created man and woman to enjoy fellowship with himself and with each other. Their disobedience alienated them from God and put into motion the battle of the sexes. So, so they are kicked out of the garden, the only home they've had, they've had, the only home they've known, which by the way, God kicking them out of the garden is also an act of love. God had to evict, evict them out of the garden. And he had to do it fast and quick. Otherwise, we all know what their next move would have been. They would have eaten from the tree of life and we would have been in a fallen condition forever. The pattern of sin and its consequences uh, that was started in the garden is replayed throughout history, throughout life, and, and, it's, and especially throughout the book of, in, of Genesis. The fall means that we as humans are bent toward sins. It, it's in us, and no amount of self-help, no amount of, of willpower, no amount of, of just wanting to, which is willpower, will, will rid us of that condition. Even though God hates sin and he punishes sin, he still loves us and he still wants a relationship with us. I don't know about you, but I find that amazing because there are some people that I don't want a relationship with because of what they do. But God, because 
in spite of what we do. He still desires to have a relationship with us. Sin does not prevent God's ultimate purpose. His ultimate purpose is to reconcile us to himself. And sin does not prevent him from doing that. The promise embedded in the curse of the serpent uh, of Satan would go forth unerupted. No matter what mankind did, God's plan would go forward. God gave the promise, but he does not reveal the details. He does not reveal to Adam and Eve how this whole thing would happen. We know because it's written, but they were left with the hope that one day the offspring of Eve would crush the serpent or Satan's head and restore the relationship between God and mankind. But once again, God would do so on his own terms. Can you imagine Eve, every time she had a son, wondering if he was the one? Of course, you know, if, if she wondered if Abel was the one, that, that hope was snatched from her because of sin. Because of sin, Cain killed his brother. The consequences of sin shows up generation after generation. Things got so bad that God sent a flood to wipe out all life on earth. But he spared a remnant, one family, eight people. But even that didn't wash the world of sin. Because tens of thousands of years later, God showed up in the life of an individual. God is still making it personal. God showed up at a time when people were doing all sorts of things. They were doing all kinds of things, trying to get God to do things on their terms. Each family even had their own gods, their own religious system. God inter intervened in a world such as that and once again started a personal relationship. This time with a man named Abram to set off his plan to redeem the world. And, and just as he was personal with Adam, God is personal with Abram. Now note that he doesn't establish a religion. He establishes a relationship. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, God comes to Abram in a very personal way. Not because Abram was special, but because of God's grace and God's mercy. In fact, history has it that Abram's family was a idol god makers g little g o d genesis the 12th chapter the new king james version starting with the first verse and going through the third it says now the lord had said to abram get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that i will show you i will make you a great nation i will bless you and Make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And if, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So all those thousands of years later, since Adam and Eve, God, in a very personal way, is saying, I'm starting over. And Abram, through you, I am laying the foundation for my son to enter the world. To right the relationship with mankind that was messed up in the garden. And, and then if we skip over to Genesis, the 15th chapter, and go to verse 6, it says that he, being Abram, believed in the Lord and he, which is God, 
accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, I need to point out here that at this time, at this moment, there is no church. But in the very moment that Abram believed God, God gave him a righteous standing. Abram made a decision to believe God. Despite the questions he had to have had, and despite the lack of details that he didn't know, despite all of the unknowns, Abram believed God. He made a decision to believe God. And God gave him, because of that decision, because of that belief, God just gave him righteousness. God, in a very personal way, got involved. Adam and Eve's sin caused God to drive them out of the garden. And he set cherubims with flaming swords to guard and to keep them from the tree of life. So after the fall, they were cut off, thrown out, and condemned to hardship and conflict. In effect, they were the walking dead. Their only hope was to wait for an offspring from Eve that would crush the serpent's head and restore the relationship between God and mankind. Through Abram, God set the stage to bring his son into the world to redeem us. And, and so the stage is set uh, for the story of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he personally got involved. He set the stage through Abram. And for us to end this week's study session, the stage is set. So join us again next time as we continue to answer the question, why was it all necessary? Until then, be blessed and God bless you. Bye-bye.